tool, um, which I would call the third evolution of the next gen schedules that we've had. So, you know, saw some changes in 2020, some new tracks that were added to the schedule in 2021. Um, and then a lot of exciting announcements today as a part of the 2022 schedule. And I think it is a, uh, a testament to the entire industry coming together, obviously a collaboration with our broadcast partners, getting a lot of feedback from our teams and OEM partners, and then a lot of feedback from our fans as well to ultimately um, create what, what we think is, is the best um, cup series schedule that, that we've had so far. So a few changes that you guys will see in the schedule, one which has already been announced at LA Coliseum, um, which we announced uh, yesterday, last night. Um, as a clash, which um, has historically been at Daytona on the oval, which moved to the road course this year. We'll be moving to Los Angeles, our number one market for NASCAR fans, number two market for viewership at a iconic and historic venue. Um, you think about the number of Olympics that they've had there with two, number of Super Bowls, Rams games, Chargers games, USC Trojans have played there since 1923. They're coming up on their 100th year anniversary, um, and we will be the first big event that they'll have there as a part of that. So really looking forward to that, looking forward to seeing the class here on February 6th next year. Um, I'm also in St. Louis today, so we had the opportunity to also announce that Worldwide Technology Raceway will be joining the 2022 Cup Series schedule on June 5th next year. Um, and I think, again, a, a testament to the job that Curtis and the entire team at Worldwide Technology Raceway does out here. Um, we've seen some great racing with an NASCAR Camping World Truck Series for the past two decades. Uh, and I think the, the Cup Series with the next-gen cars uh, will not disappoint. We've got a ton of great fans in the St. Louis area and, uh, and really looking forward to that. Outside of that, um, a, a few additional changes to the schedule that we've made as well. Bristol Dirt will be moving to Easter Sunday and on prime time, um, a decision that we made and you know, I think in the spirit of um, this year's event, you know, we learned that it's important for us to, to make sure that that dirt event is into the evening or under the lights. Um, and we're able to, to secure that primetime window on um, Fox that evening. And you think about all the other sports leagues with, you know, NFL on, on Thanksgiving, NBA on Christmas. You know, this is our opportunity to, uh, to run on Easter Sunday and, and drive a lot of momentum for our fans that are watching at home um, through Fox's season and through NBC season from start to finish. Um, outside of that, a small shakeup to the, to the playoff schedule that we're going to have. So a few movements um, with Kansas, Las Vegas, Texas, and then introducing Homestead Miami Speedway um, to the playoff schedule. You know, something that we've heard from our fans for a while now is that they love the racing action at Homestead Miami Speedway. You know, of the mile and a half tracks that we go to, probably one of the better mile and a half tracks we go to from a racing product. Uh, and being that time of year in October, a lot of our fans uh, certainly love to vacation in South Florida. Uh, we know a lot of potential new fans are, are down there as well. I think a great opportunity to introduce that um, to the playoff slate as well. Finally, we'll have our uh, a championship at Phoenix again next year. So really looking forward to, uh, to heading back out to the West Coast. Uh, always puts on a, a great show and a great market for us. Um, and a, a, lot of, a lot of big changes to the 22 schedule and, uh, and looking forward to, uh, to talking about it here. So um, Matt, I will uh, I'll flip it over to you if, if anyone has any questions. Perfect, thanks, Ben. Appreciate you running through that. We're gonna open up to, to media now. Just a couple quick reminders. Um, if you are not, not speaking or asking a question, please keep your line on mute. Um, and we'll answer as many questions as we can here uh, with the time we have uh, with, with Ben. So with that, I will, uh, I will go ahead and kick it off. Uh, Claire B. Lang at Sirius, Sirius XM NASCAR Radio. Thank you. You know, when I talked to you way before the schedule was released, we talked about bold decisions, right? And you promised bold. What do you think was the most bold decision or several of them that took the most conversation for you guys to make your mind up on? Um, I, I don't know if it, it took the most conversation because it was a difficult decision, um, but I, I would say the LA Coliseum, I think just it, it's something we, we frankly, we've never done before in our sports history. You know, we had Soldier Field um, back in 1956 as a stadium event, but we've never actually constructed a temporary quarter mile uh, short track inside of a stadium before. So, um, you know, I, I think a lot of internal conversations as we think about logistics, design development of the track, and then just what that event is truly going to be like. Um, it's been an opportunity for us to 
to think differently um, about what that event is going to look like um, and a lot of good thoughts and feedback that we've, we've received um, both internally and with our partners in since the announcement yesterday. So um, I would say that that's probably been one of the biggest ones that, um, that we've been looking at. And if you wouldn't mind as a follow up, I'd like to defer to a fan since I asked my listeners if they had any questions. Doug Stevenson says, why did they put the fall Kansas race on the Sunday afternoon on the first Sunday of the NFL season of the NFL season when they could have run it on the Saturday night and avoided the conflict similar to what fall Richmond was this year? So I'll let Doug take the question. Yeah, so I think on on that one, um, you know, we moved Kansas a little bit later in the playoffs um, as a part of the new playoff schedule that we had um, in 2020 and 2021. We felt like it was important to move Kansas a little bit earlier into the season to help from a weather standpoint. And then, um, you know, to answer your question on Saturday night versus Sunday, you know, I would say that a lot of our, our fans, um, myself included, are accustomed to um, – turning racing on and NASCAR racing in particular on, on Sunday afternoon. So um, I think we all have that habit and, um, you know, certainly helped us kind of drive the decision to, uh, to move that there. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Claire. All right, let's go to Jeff Gluck. Hey, Ben, um, you know, for the last couple of decades, at least, there's been certain parts of the schedule that have been sort of like considered unmovable, whether it's like not racing on Mother's Day, not racing on Easter, um, you know, the July 4th Daytona tradition, starting the season at Daytona, um, or even like two races a year at Dover, Michigan, Pocono. Now, all those things in a very short amount of time have changed. What, what's the thinking behind now being the time to really be flexible with that? And say, you know what, we don't we don't have to do that kind of thing. I think it really speaks to um, a lot of the changes that we've made in the schedule, whether that's the new venues that we go to, some of um, the reconfigurations that we've seen, like the Indy Road Course or Bristol Dirt, um, or to your point, running on Mother's Day and, and running on Easter weekend. And I think it was it was part of us being bold and, and innovative in this with the schedule, but also being very measured too. You know, a lot of these decisions that, that we're making um, obviously come with a lot of consulting with our broadcast partners, getting feedback from the industry, um, and then doing a ton of research um, on our fans, our avid fans, casual fans, and new fans for what they would like to see as far as racing goes and, and what time of year. So that, uh, that ultimately led to a decision uh, to move Darlington to uh, Mother's Day weekend, like we did uh, this year in 2021. And then ultimately, uh, Bristol Dirt to Easter Sunday. Let's go to Davy Seagal next. Hey, Ben. Uh, there was some positive feedback this year about the two-week Olympic break, and there's only one off weekend for 2022. So I'm curious what the feedback has been from industry people to you specifically about only having one off weekend throughout next year. Yeah, you know, it's something that we're certainly looking at and, um, you know, know it's nice to have the, the two week off week with the Olympic break and I think it was a, a natural break for our season this year. You know, that said, if you look at our schedule kind of overall, you know, starting on President's Day weekend, as we traditionally have with the Daytona 500 and ending our season um, at Phoenix with the championship race, by the time you lay out the entire schedule, um, really, ultimately, it, it leads to only one off week if we're running on um, Sundays and on weekends. So with that said, we felt like it's important, um, especially for our fans that are sitting at home um, watching the event or coming out to a race to have a lot of momentum from the start of our season at Daytona, the Daytona 500, all the way to Sonoma, where Fox will close their portion of the season. Um, and then from Nashville Super Speedway, where NBC picks us up, um, all the way to the championship race at Phoenix. So I wanted to drive a lot of momentum. I know we'll only have one off week between Fox and NBC. Uh, that said, I think it will drive a lot of momentum for our sport and for our fans, um, but something that we'll, we'll continuously look at as we think about future iterations of the schedule is, is where are those off weeks and, uh, and where are they located. Great, thank you. Thanks. All right, next let's go to Zach Dean at the uh, Daytona Beach News Journal. Hey, Ben, uh, you kind of mentioned the fan perspective. Obviously, down here today, a bit of a different reaction. Fans pretty unanimously are pretty angry losing the clash. What, and obviously, what, what would you say to that fan who's kind of saying, oh, well, you know, this is kind of the start of our speed week. So, so what do you say to that fan 
who's who's pretty angry today that obviously they're losing a a, a race down here. You know, the Daytona 500 um, has always been and will always be our, our biggest event of the season. So um, having that on President's Day weekend is a, is a pinnacle of our season. Um, and then you think about the other events that, that have led up to that weekend. To your point, one of them being the Clash, but the Duels, Truck, Arca, Xfinity, um, a lot of exciting content that I, I think we've provided for the fans and something that we want to not only continue to, de to deliver going forward, but we want to continue to elevate moving forward too, whether that's from a fan experience standpoint, the amount of content that we have in and around Daytona, um, but always a, a critically important week to our part of the schedule, um, the most important part of the week, and, um, and something that we'll, we'll continue to look at going forward. Is there a chance the Clash could return to Daytona in the future? You know, it's something that we'll continue um, to look at. You know, I, I think we saw a, a good race on the road course this year. It was it was fun to shake it up um, and, and see some road course racing at Daytona and on Tuesday night leading into the 500. Um, that said, we, we made a, a pretty big shift in moving it over to Los Angeles in the Coliseum um, a week before the Super Bowl and two weeks before Daytona 500. And you know, I, I think and hope that that will just drive even more momentum into um, the biggest event of our season, Daytona. So to answer your question, it'll be something that we'll, we'll continue to look at for sure. Thanks. Thanks. All right, let's go to Lee Spencer next. Thank you, and thanks for joining us today. Um, kind of curious about it seems that we're moving into more urban markets so to speak with the LA Coliseum with Gateway I mean Gateway's a five minute drive to downtown St. Louis um is there been a push to bring the product to the masses rather than waiting for the masses to come to us yeah you know I think it's a good question and, and to your point exactly um I'm sitting in downtown St. Louis right now and I'm only a five minute drive from Worldwide Technology Raceway so um, I think to your point, it's an opportunity to bring the racing action to our fans um, and to bring some new fans out to the track to sample our sport and sample the Cup Series that haven't had the opportunity to do so before. So you know, I think that's part of the calculus. And then, um, you know, on top of that as well, going to the Los Angeles market. Um, and we're excited to be back out in Fontana Auto Club Seaway again um, in late February of next year, but also going to um, downtown Los Angeles, which is another, you know, five to 10 minute drive um, from the Los Angeles Coliseum, I think, you know, brings that opportunity to really bring the racing action to the fans that are in these large urban markets where you have a lot of fans um, and, and give them the opportunity to not only come out and experience the race, um, but also come out for the first time too and see what it's like. And, and is it fair to say that when you look at potential um track owners, someone of the nature of Curtis Francois went over and beyond what he needed to do to prove that they were, um, I guess, uh, deserving of, of getting a race date, whether it was what their community activity was, their philanthropic activity was, um, you know, did that all play a role in Gateway securing a date for next year? Yeah, it certainly did. And, and Curtis, this has been a, a great partner of ours uh, throughout the past several years with the Camping World Truck Series being in St. Louis. Um, and, and that was certainly a big part of the reason, you know, his leadership, um, the entire Worldwide Technology Raceway team, um, and then the amount of, of local and, and community involvement that, that is around that as well. So I was just at an event this morning, you had the, the mayor of St. Louis there, um, several different individuals and stakeholders from the Cardinals and Blues and um, a lot of local leaders, um, worldwide technology. It, it's great to see the the local support and camaraderie around it. And I, I think and know that the, the fans will come around it uh, for sure in June next year. Super safe travels. Thank you. All right, let's go to Jordan Bianchi. Hey, Ben, appreciate the time. Um, the, my question is about Pocono. Um, that was one notable change about the schedule. It is losing a date. First time it's not going to have two dates since the early 80s. Uh, I have two questions. First question is, can you take me through the process and what went into that for Pocono to, to lose a date? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I think on the Pocono front and similar to the rest of our schedule, you know, we're always looking at, um, you know, both our existing tracks and our, and our new tracks. And, 
you know, as we shifted over to St. Louis, ultimately those shifts, um, you know, come from somewhere last year, you know, Chicago land and Kentucky came off the schedule, but you know, what I will tell you is we do have great racing out in Pocono and the Mattioli and Nick Igdalski and the entire family have been great partners of us for several decades and they'll continue to be um, partners of ours going into the future as well. So I um, want to want to continue that relationship and partnership and the Northeast is an important area for us um, to be in and only a couple hours from um, another very large market in New York. So uh, really important for us to, to continue to be there and, uh, and continue to work with the team up there. And then the second question I had was, was there any financial considerations given to Pocono or any kind of make good to kind of ease the, ease the fact that they're losing a date and, and, you know, that income that comes from the TV side of things? Yeah, so, so can't get into any of the details or, or share more on that. But again, what I can tell you is uh, we have a great relationship with the Mayaviolis and Nick Kikdalski and the entire team and, and look forward to, uh, to having them on the schedule in, in 2021 or 2020. Sorry. Thank you very much. All right, let's go to Jeff Megliaschetti. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, congratulations on this schedule release. The Clash going to Los Angeles. Is this something that could start a bit of a trend of holding races, exhibition races on quote unquote unconventional courses, or do you plan to stick in LA for the long term? You know, I think it's a great question and it'll be interesting to see um, not only the feedback and sentiment coming out of the February event next year, but um, you know, what that type of racing could look like in general. You know, if you overlay Bowman Gray Stadium on top of the track surface that we have at the LA Coliseum, it's, uh, it's almost identical. And, and we've seen some great racing at Bowman Gray Stadium. I think from a racing product standpoint, the Coliseum will not disappoint. Um, and, you know, I think to also answer your question, as we think about um, kind of new markets and in particular for some of our international series, um, I think it opens the door to explore um, new cities and, and new markets and emerging markets that we haven't been to before. So something that we're, we're definitely looking at. And, you know, I think part of the reasoning behind, um, you know, moving to the Coliseum with the, the multitude of others is, uh, is really proof of concept. So proof of concept for the track, the events, uh, the format, the sporting events, all the things that, that really go around that weekend. And another absence on this schedule is the Daytona Road Course, which is filled in, which is filled in pretty well during the 2020 and 2021 seasons. Could you envision NASCAR's National Series returning to Daytona's Road Course, or is that tabled for the time being? Um, for 2022, it, it is tabled. It is something that we'll we'll definitely take a look at. Um, you know, again, I, I think there's a ton of history on the road course at Daytona. When you think about the 24 hours at Daytona, I had the opportunity to go there and always knew that it was a really special event, um, not, only, not only to EMSA, but um, to the, the entire Daytona Beach and, and Florida area as well. So something that we'll, we'll definitely continue to take a look at as, uh, as we think about future schedules, but know our fans love to see road course racing and um, it, it was neat to see them on the road course this year. Appreciate your time and insight. Congratulations once again. Thank you. Appreciate it, Jeff. Let's go over to Steve in Toronto. I have two questions, if that's all right. Uh, ben, first of all, in regards to the Bristol dirt race being held on Easter Sunday, uh, I, know, I know you mentioned uh, Thanksgiving for the NFL, uh, Christmas Day being among the uh, dates where events like this are held. But Easter, as you understand, is a rather solemn religious holiday. Uh, when you made the decision to put that race on Easter Sunday, uh, was there any concern over uh, people in the industry about going out and working on a day where a lot of people, on a day that a lot of people like to spend at church and with their families? Yeah, we, we, we put a lot of um, consideration into that, Steve, and it, you know, I, th I think to that end, having it um, later in the day and on prime time on Sunday, we want to make sure that for fans, families, team members, drivers, that they have the opportunity um, to celebrate earlier on in the day. And then for fans that may be um, tuning in at night or coming out to the track that evening, um, the ability to come out there and, and continue to, to be together and watch NASCAR racing, we felt like was important. So you know, a big part of the calculus of that decision was was making sure that um, that event was later on in the evening um, on that day. 
And then in regards to Gateway gaining a date and Pocono losing a date, uh, just in terms of markets, is there any concern now that the Midwest gaining another race makes that market overserved? And then as a consequence, the Northeast market becomes underserved. You know, I think it's a it's a great question. And, and to your point, we saw a, um, a shift from Dover to Nashville Super Speedway, which is uh, a big market for us. Uh, and now with the addition of, of worldwide technology raceway to the schedule, you know, something that we've seen um, in particular in St. Louis, but the Midwest region as well. Um, a lot of fans are, are based out of there and it's it's growing um, as well. So if you think about the number of um, local short tracks that we have and, and dirt tracks throughout the Midwest region, we have a ton of fans in this area and we feel like uh, it was deserving of, of bringing another race here. You know, that said, the Northeast is still a critical um, place for us to be. We have a ton of fans, especially in that New York, um, New Jersey area. As you think about New Hampshire, you think about Pocono and you think about Dover, um, it's important that we continue to have a presence there and continue to race there because that is another critical part of the country. Gotcha. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. All right, let's move over to Alan Cavana. Hey, Ben, thanks for joining us. Uh, now that we've been through, I mean, almost a full season with all the changes, CODA, the road courses, new venues and all that stuff, what has been the biggest takeaway or lesson learned from all this change? And whether it was a benefit or the feedback you got, what's been the biggest takeaway from the change? Um, I, I think the biggest takeaway um, that we've seen is, is in particular with some of these new venues that we've introduced to the schedule and some of the changes in the schedule um, is the amount of excitement and engagement we have for a lot of these new tracks. So, you know, take Nashville Super Speedway as an example um, here in the 2021 season, you know, to have a, a sold out crowd and so much energy around that event, um, I, I think really speaks to, um, you know, the decisions that were made and, you know, again, how many fans we have in that Nashville area. And, you know, same thing goes for, for Road America as an example, a ton of great fans out there. So, I think the 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 most I don't know if it's eye opening, but um, one of the neatest things to see is um, kind of the reception that we've had from the fan base and from the industry for a lot of these changes that we've made within the schedule. Does that offer I don't know less risk, but are you more likely now to look toward changes now that you did get some of that positive feedback? Yeah, I think that's fair. You know, as we looked at the 2021 schedule, is a lot of uh, there's a lot of tracks that we felt like were feasible, but very strategic for us as we thought um, about that schedule. And as we look to 2022, um, the LA Coliseum and a concept like that is a little bit out of the box for us. Um, again, we've never done anything like that before in our sports history. Um, and, and to be able to do that and pull something like that off, I, I think, you know, will continue to, uh, to give us options as we look forward um, into the future. You know, that said, we want to be very measured and calculated as we make a lot of these decisions. Again, um, you know, a ton of a ton of data and insights that uh, the scheduling team at NASCAR takes a look at to make sure that we're we're making decisions that are in the best interest of the sport. Thank you. Thanks. All right, let's move over to Scott Walsh. Thank you. Um, ben, uh, can you tell a little bit more about uh, about Pocono? Does this mean uh, uh, did it have the decision have anything to do with the doubleheader weekend? Uh, maybe NASCAR wasn't uh, happy with it, or uh, uh, it felt the way it uh, you know it, it didn't go off as as maybe they expected. Um, no, I, I, I don't think so. You know, we had the we had the opportunity um, last year um, during the pandemic, seeing that we had to get all of our events in in a relatively short period of time to test out midweek racing to test out double headers. Um, and I think double headers in general and, and not, you know, pointing to Pocono in particular, but just double headers in general. Um, you know, I think from a, a fan perspective, our fans again are accustomed to, to tuning in on Sunday afternoon and, and seeing NASCAR cup series racing. And for a fan going out there to the track to have the biggest event of the weekend on that Sunday afternoon, um, I think gives them something to look forward to and builds anticipation um, around the weekend too. So, you know, again, the, the Mattiolis and, and the entire family um, up there have been great partners and we look forward to, to continue to, to have racing at Pocono Raceway. And, and just a, a follow-up, I realize those schedules aren't out yet, but are, is Pocono going to continue to have a Xfinity series and a truck series race? 
Yeah, so we'll share more on the Xfinity and Truck Series schedule in, uh, in the next few weeks. We're, we're finalizing a, a few details on that as we speak, um, and we'll, we'll share more about what those, uh, those weekend schedules look like. Thank you. Thanks. All right, let's go to Daniel McFadden. Hey, Ben. Uh, you, you mentioned that if you put uh, Bowman Gray Stadium over the track that you're going to race on in L.A. that's virtually identical, if they're identical – why not just take the clash to Bowman Gray Stadium, uh, a permanent track where you don't have to build something temporarily? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, Daniel. And you know, I, I think the the biggest reasoning behind it is um, going to the Los Angeles market. You know, a week before the Super Bowl, two weeks before Daytona 500. Um, if you look at the schedule today for that exhibition event, the only place that we could realistically put it at was ahead of the Daytona 500 and ahead of our season, um, given all the back-to-back -back racing and then making sure that we have that off week within the season. You know, I think on top of that, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, a, a huge market that we have in Los Angeles, the number one market for a number of NASCAR fans, uh, number two for viewership and, and number one for, uh, for 18 to 34 year olds. So we know we haven't been running in LA for the past few years with the pandemic and everything going on. And we felt like it was important for us to get back um, to the Southern California market and in a special way with the Coliseum and with the 25th anniversary out at Fontana. So. Thank you. Thanks. All right. We've got time for just a couple more. Let's go to Nathan Solomon. Yeah, Ben, thanks for your time today. Well, when you look at, you know, Watkins, Ben, and Daytona there and back-to-back and -back weeks to conclude the regular season, what went into making that decision to, to move Watkins and back a couple of weeks? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and uh, I'm glad you noticed that. So, you know, something that, that we took a look at um, in particular was the, the end of the regular season um, with Richmond, Watkins, Glen leading into Daytona as our cutoff for the regular season. We felt like it was important – uh, to really have a, a lot of um, some of our exciting tracks lead into the end of um, our, our regular season. So Watkins Glen has been one of them. They always put on a great show at Watkins Glen, and uh, it's always great being up in the, the New York area. So wanted to have that uh, leading into Daytona. We know we moved it back a, a week or two for this year, but um, I think it'll be a welcome part of the schedule. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, last, last question. We'll go over to Matt Weaver. Hey, Ben. Appreciate the time today. Real quick, a follow-up to one of Stephen's questions. Uh, we talk about saturation in the Midwest and maybe not so much in the Northeast now, but there's a lot of fans in the Pacific Northwest that have been clamoring for a race for a long time. Have you guys kind of internalized conversations about going there? Yeah, thanks for the question, Matt. You know, I, I think the Northeast, again, um, huge market for us. So we talk about L.A. being the number one market. Uh, that New York area is the number two market that we have um, in the United States. It's an important market for us, and it's important that we be there, too. Um, and it's something that, that we've also been, been taking a look at as well. So, um, you know, nothing to announce on the 22 schedule, but as we look towards future schedules, that will be an important area that we, uh, we take a look at. And my other question is more of a, a very broad question. Um, historically, NASCAR's identity has been ovals. That's evolved from dirt ovals to paved short tracks, now super speedways. There's a lot of diversity in this schedule, a little bit of everything, uh, featuring a car that's been inspired by road racing, a GT3 supercar. So I'm curious, again, very broadly, what would you tell fans NASCAR's identity is moving forward with next gen with this car and this schedule? Yeah, I think, you know, first and foremost, the next gen car is is not only going to bring a, a lot of relevance um, back to our vehicles, but it's also going to create in what I think is going to be the best uh, racing product that, that we'll have in our sports history. So the cars look fantastic. Um, I think in, in seeing some of the data and, and research that they've done that the racing product will be better than ever. And, you know, I think as it speaks to the schedule um, and we have um, several charts that we look at of the evolution of, you know, where we were in 2020 and the mixture of intermediates, road courses, super speedways to where we're at today. Um, you have a dirt race on the schedule. You have um, a handful of super speedways. You have a handful of intermediates. You have a handful of short tracks um, and a little bit of everything. So, 
you know, I, I think with that diversity in the schedule, um, it, it really means that whoever is going to be that regular season champion and ultimately the NASCAR Cup Series champion um, is the best driver in the NASCAR Cup Series. And what I would say, probably one of the, the best drivers in the world, too. Thanks, Ben. All right. Thank you, everybody. That's all the time we have. Ben, really appreciate your time. And uh, you, know, you put a lot of hard work in on this schedule. So, so congratulations on this 2022 version. Um, for all of our media, appreciate you joining us. And uh, thanks for all your hard work as well and your continued coverage of the sport. If you're heading to Bristol, uh, safe travels, and we will see you there. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you.